Good evening, friends, and welcome to St. Thomas More's online video series in honor and celebration of Black History Month. This event is brought to you by St. Thomas More's Image and Likeness Committee, a ministry that yearns to promote a culture of racial healing and reconciliation within the parish and beyond. This month, we celebrate Black history, and the Image and Likeness Committee is very excited to bring Danita Mason Hogans from Chapel Hill to discuss the importance of tre and treasure of America's own Black history. I also want to remind the audience that at any time throughout tonight's presentation, please comment a question directed to the um, comment section, and we will do our best to get to them at the very end. Before we dive into tonight's event, and before I introduce you all to Danita, let's take a moment to start this night with some prayer. This is a prayer taken from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. We begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Embracing Father, you grace each of us with equal measure in your love. Let us learn to love our neighbors more deeply so that we can create peaceful and just communities. Inspire us to use our creative energies to build the structures we need to overcome the obstacles of intolerance and indifference. May Jesus provide us the example needed and send the spirit to warm our hearts for the journey. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, let's get started with tonight's presentation. I am honored to introduce Danita Mason Hogans. Danita is an award-winning civil rights historian, educator, speaker, writer, and activist. She's a native of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, from seven generations on both sides of her family. The daughter of Dave Mason of the Chapel Hill Nine, who began the first sit-in of Chapel Hill's civil rights movement, igniting decades of protests against segregation. Danita's acclaimed TEDx talk, Why the Way We Tell Stories is a Social Justice Issue, was featured on TEDx, where she describes the critical oral history methodology, which she uses for her podcast, Recollecting Chapel Hill. I'll upload the link to this TEDx talk in our Facebook comments as well. Working with school systems, universities, activists, and historians, Danita collaborates and consults to document local and national history from the inside out and from the bottom up. Her current avocation is for an educational program for the descendants of the enslaved. I'll also link that website of her current program in the Facebook, Facebook comments as well. It's an honor to have Danita speaking with us tonight. And before Danita begins, she would like to start the presentation with this video. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. A beautiful day, what a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? I grew up in a city where progress and distress go hand in hand like glove and mitt. Grew up watching egos trip on sidewalks full of wallets and money clips a sinking ship. Whose captain reassures everyone to secure their belts and stay strapped in director yells action and we... We play like we don't see the props in the form of expensive shops and parking lots. Human rights on the chopping block bothers us a lot. Just not enough to tell them stop. They bulldoze blocks and hide their hands. Seemingly spontaneous construction, the way they roll these rocks and divide the land so fast it seems they stole the clocks and hid the sands. And on days like this, here I am. In a wonderful little college town where true feelings are glossed over with PC wax like the floors in hospitals and the impossibles are made to seem possible. Between the hellos and how you doings, I feel the hatred brewing as she clutches her purse a little tighter, telling herself, I'm no racist. I have black guy friends. It's just the ones I don't know I'm scared of as if black men were pit bulls without leashes. The plight of a black man in a white town where he's only good if he's affluent or submissive, speaks proper English, and his clothes fit proper black man. I'm working a job with a dress code, no tattoos, well-groomed as a student, and has a degree of some sort in this lovely little college town 
where armchair progressives are a dime a dozen and social consciousness is a verbal state of mind that really only lies in revolutionary cotton teas, dreads, and blowing trees. Che is great and we love and try our best to emulate Bob Marley and Gandhi, Chapel Hill. But the predominantly black and Latino parts of the city have been reduced to a quarter of the size they used to be and or moved far away as not to tarnish the image of the university, a university that has erected a 20-foot-tall monument representing a Confederate soldier in the Civil War, Silent Sam, and less than 100 yards away. There's a monument to the builders of the university. That's a table. A table that has these two-foot-high slaves holding it up. The last time I walked past, it was a lovely family enjoying lunch. I say what reverence we show. So making them be the foundation for the nourishment of this nation. Still no bill for reparations. And me in this hospital, I'm a struggling doctor. I need patients because this hospital seems like it's really an asylum while the upper class lend hands to their rich artistic friends and stand over the impoverished scratching of the insides of coffins with the lumber that built this town under that fingernails chapel thrill, where students swarm in to swap the culture they were raised on in exchange for frats and sorors, kimchi for cake stands, tamales for top of the hill, curry for curriculum, and until recently in March, until Eve Carson's murder in March, basketball games and rivalries have been more important than murder rates. It's madness. I live in a wonderful little college town where true feelings are glossed over with PC wax like the floors in asylums. Welcome to the neighborhood. Good evening. I deeply appreciate being invited here today, and I'm grateful to Amanda for all of her assistance, her patience, and overall kindness. I want you to know that it is a great honor for me to present at the church that is making history with the Thomas P. Haddon Reparative Scholarship. This is groundbreaking stuff, and I applaud you for that. The film that we just saw was of Black Chapel Hillians in 1941 by the filmmaker H. Lee Waters. <clears throat> the voiceover from the film was C.J. Sue, a local generational Chapel Hillian and poet laureate for the town of Chapel Hill. And the title of his piece is called Wonderful Little College Town. <clears throat> CJ makes me so proud with his poetry and voice because he comes from a family like mine for many generations in Chapel Hill. And he, like me, has a lot to offer to the persistent narrative of this wonderful little college town in the Southern part of heaven. But like so many of us local generational black folk, our view of this town is from the perspective from the other side of the tracks. And it is important to talk about our narrative because we too sing America and we too sing Chapel Hill. So the mention of a public university in North Carolina came about in 1776. 
and the university started to come into fruition in 1789, making UNC the nation's oldest public university. And I often contend that the plight of local Black people in Chapel Hill and at this university parallels the plight of Black people in America. And so like many other local people, when the university was being built in 1789, our ancestors, along with the native people from this area were here. I descend from the union between the Morgan and the Mason families who donated land for the establishment of the town of Chapel Hill and the university before the town or university were ever even established. The natives built the bricks and my ancestors laid the foundation for this university and for the town along with it. I am so proud to share this photo of my great, great grandmother. Amanda, please share the first photo with you. Her name was Emma and she was born into enslavement. My great, great grandmother Emma places a human face on those who were forced to work without pay or human decency for this university and town since their inception. Unlike most public universities in the US, UNC was founded with escheated property. Do y'all know what an escheat is? An escheated property is when a person dies without heirs and the state inherits the property. So you can see by this process that since UNC was the benefactor of this property, the wealth was meager at the beginning, but continued to accumulate. Over the years, the contributions were colossal. It became so profitable that UNC hired attorneys all over the state of North Carolina to identify and to collect its escheats. The challenge for us local black generational folk is however that in 1789, our ancestors were a part of the wealth that was acquired by UNC. And my ancestors were rented out or sold away to finance what would become one of the world's greatest universities. Not only was UNC built with black blood, sweat and tears, with bricks constructed from stolen native lands, black bodies literally were the physical and economic foundation of this university. You can take the photo down. Thank you, Amanda. But I would like to offer that it's really important to contextualize this history. And it is important to contextualize this history because narrative is important. Narratives shape perceptions, perceptions shape values, and values shape policies. It is very important to remember this history because this is the way that my people were perceived and therefore valued as property and not people and were subject to the policies that remain with us today. So my beautiful great great grandmother Emma gave birth to my great grandfather Ernest. Amanda the second photo please. With his handsome self as you can as you can clearly see and I knew my granddaddy and he was my first best friend. And when I was five years old, when I got off the bus, he would greet me with a hearty laugh and a big grin. And I would run into his arms and kiss his soft face. And we would rush to the radio and listen to the obituaries to see which of his friends had made it to the other side. <laughs> so you can take the photo down, please. Thank you. Granddaddy used to babysit me and tell the best stories. Some were really funny and some were not. Like the fact that when he was a little boy, his family was so poor that they only had cornmeal to eat. Granddaddy Ernest's father, the husband to the woman in the photo, he was enslaved in Chapel Hill. And he told my grandfather Ernest stories too. 
before I learned from Polly Murray, George Moses Horton, and Samuel Morphis about the desperation, the poverty, and the starvation Black people experienced in this area when local slave owners were defeated in the war and abandoned the human beings that they once provided food, shelter, and clothing for and left them to fend for themselves, often to survive in the woods or starve to death. My great-great-grandfather talked about how difficult it was for Black people in Chapel Hill and in Orange County and in Durham and the surrounding areas. And he specifically told a story that his owner during the war would rub hog grease on the mouths of the enslaved here because he was too proud to admit that he could not feed his slaves. And this was a common practice around in this area and a story that is not often told. But granddaddy Ernest, my great grandfather, was born in 1895, right around the time of the renovation of the old well at UNC. And the university began a water system that was able to provide utility service to members of the town's white community. Meanwhile, local black people section of town had no sewage and waste was taken away from houses by horse and wagon. You may remember in the film, there was an example of the horse and a wagon. The university owned the water utilities and, and had never extended this utility service to the black neighborhoods. Although UNC piped water from its intake main through the black community, the water remained untreated until it got to the campus. It was then pumped back out to the most, most of the white sections of town but not to the black community, with the exception of the well-documented and frequent leaks from the untreated water that caused the communities to become contaminated and diseases that persisted. In 1924, a town report found out that nearly all of the water in the black community was polluted, although representations of the black, representatives of the black community had petitioned the town government more than once to install water and sewer connections. This is hard to believe, but it is true. In fact, some of the neighborhoods in Chapel Hill did not receive electricity and clean water until the 1970s. Amanda, photo three, please. Sewage, toxic water, and diseases that came with it, such as cancer, have continued to plague us local Black people and people of color all across the country. This is a photo of an outhouse and it was taken by the wonderful Chapel Hill native, Jack Lauderer. And it was taken in 1967, the year that I was born. You can take the photo down. Thank you, Amanda. But during this time, the university no longer needed laborers to live in proximity close to the, who they served. However, this new arrangement provided housing opportunities for Black folks and meant that more Black people were able to build their own neighborhoods. So granddaddy, unlike his father, was able to build a house in the North Side community when he grew older. It's important to understand that for families like mine, separate but equal was the law of the land. But it is also important to keep in mind that it was never our existence in Chapel Hill. For us, it was never the southern part of heaven. It was never the southern part of heaven then, and it still isn't to this day. While others inherited the connections and resources that come with being affiliated with UNC, we inherited harsh and unequal housing, health care policing, and education for a full 90 years after the enslavement. Now, this condition has been pervasive and systemic for almost 80% of our existence here in Chapel Hill. And because, as Professor William Sturkey says, 
History doesn't just go backward, it goes forward too. It is important to talk about the intersectional racialized history of Chapel Hill. You see, I call us local generational black people, the invisible town. And I call us that because we carry the names, but not the privilege of the legacy of those who built great fortunes and constructed false narratives. We've always been here working in a town and for a system that was designed to serve and elevate the university and therefore the town and keep us invisible and content with what I call our sugar-coated oppression. So great granddaddy Ernest married Nettie and they named their daughter Emma too after his mother. Emma grew up and married my granddaddy David. That's photo number four, Amanda. My grandfather, David Mason Sr worked at the Carolina Inn for 53 years. And to this day, I love to collect change because granddaddy's pockets always made the nicest sound when they jingled, when he was working as a bell person and would receive tips for the day. And he was a sweet granddaddy too. And, and sometimes he would give me quarters from his earnings so that I could buy potato chips. And I also remember being confused and livid after hearing someone call my grandfather, this great man, this pillar of the community and giant to me, they called him a boy and they demanded that he bring this young man's clothes to his room. Now, I was more than ready to back up my grandfather and bring all of my eight-year-old self to the fight that I just knew was about to go down. After all, imagine this teenager ordering my granddad around, but my beautiful grandfather, he just smiled and he told the young man that he'd be right up. And he explained to me that I shouldn't be upset because this was just his job. And guess what? Next photo, please, Amanda. After 53 years of service to the Carolina Inn, the location where it all began for our town, known as the Chapel on the Hill, my noble grandfather worked in the plantation styled inn and was called a boy until he retired. Photo down, please. Thank you, Amanda. My grandfather and Uncle Matthew also worked as houseboys at UNC roughly from about 1934 until 1972. My grandfather and Uncle Matthew were made honorary members of the Pi Delta and Pi Kappa Alpha fraternities for their years of service. And because of their connection to these fraternities, the members would allow them to take home leftover food and would sometimes give bonuses and clothing for them to share with their families and also people around the town. And local Black people needed that additional support too, because in addition to the racial terror that existed in Chapel Hill, which is well documented, and specifically in the year 1937, this was also the time period where people in Chapel Hill and Carborough, Black citizens, were denied most of the benefits of the New Deal legislation which gave relief to its white citizens. These New Deal initiatives offered local white people who were suffering from poverty during the Great Depression relief. And this relief came in the form of better jobs and higher salaries and a commitment to better working conditions, new housing, construction, and better infrastructure for the white areas of the town. The benefit to the white community is still enjoyed today. While during the same time period, black people were overtaxed, cheated out of their land, and were regulated to lower paying unskilled Negro jobs, is what they called them. And these jobs were not covered by the Fair Labor Act. The impact of this era 
is important because it is still being felt in the local black community too. The white community received paved streets and better infrastructure in 1939, while the local black communities largely had to wait until 1969 to receive electricity and running water under the Howard Lee administration. So my grandmother, Emma, gave birth to my father, David Jr. That's the next photo, please, Amanda. Now this photo was taken in February, 1960. This is the same month that he and eight other teenagers from the all black Lincoln High School, led by the brilliant Harold Foster, staged what would become Chapel Hill's first sit-in and the first sit-in in the country that was conceived, planned and executed by high school students. Dr. Martin Luther King was so inspired by these high school students at Lincoln High that he traveled to Chapel Hill in April of 1960 to encourage them and to let them know how proud he was of them when he came and delivered a speak at Hargraves Recreation Center. And Dr. King was not the only one. Ella Baker heard of them too. And she invited two of the high school students, Harold Foster and William Curitan, to Raleigh to attend a meeting in April of 1960, later to form SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Now, I'd like to share with you that this is something that Chapel Hill should be proud of because this invitation was unusual. Most of the students who were invited to this conference were high school or college students. In fact, out of the 60 educational cohorts who were invited to come to the conference, only eight were from high schools. You can take the photo down. Thank you, Amanda. Imagine this history comes right here from Chapel Hill. These young people were so impressive that not only did Dr. King and Ella Baker shower them with praise and urge them to keep on fighting, soon the students from the Congress on Racial Equality came to Orange County and to NCCU to teach these brave young people how to fight with nonviolence and with their words and actions. I think that um, community historian and journalist, Mike Ogle, summed it up best with his excellent Stonewall series, where he quoted Dr. Martin Luther King during his April visit to Chapel Hill. Dr. King came to Hargraves Community Center to encourage the young people whose bravery started the movement and said, you are not seeking to put stores that practice discrimination out of business. You are seeking to put justice in business. Tell the businessmen, you respect our dollars, now respect our persons. And that was the gist of the civil rights movement in Chapel Hill. Because what the Chapel Hill Nine did for our community was monumental indeed. But we need not to ascribe to the romantic notions of superhuman heroism and mystical tales of the civil rights movement. We need to state that the actions that these young people and young people all over the country took resulted from being impoverished, mistreated, and ignored for many generations. And the reason we need to contextualize this history once again is because narrative is important. Chapel Hill's history of racism and exclusion goes all the way back to the beginning of the formation of this country. But what I'd like to share with you tonight, friends, is that we don't talk about enough also, is that where there is oppression, there is also, also always resistance. And those stories of resistance are important to tell too. And if you were to talk with my father and the members of the Chapel Hill Nine, they will tell you that the inspiration to stand on what was right came from the black church and white faith leaders 
such as the Reverend Charles Jones. You see, when integration came for the schools and the schools were merged in 1966, which by the way, was 12 years after Brown v. Board, our invisible town lost 75% of our teachers and administrators, our brilliant student leadership and our student organizations. And it's important to know this history because since then, the divide has persisted. This is so important. Chapel Hill, at the same time, has one of the highest performing student populations and the second largest achievement gap and therefore opportunity gap in the country. And because of the history of the exploitive labor relationship between the university and town and local black people, Orange County has the widest wealth gap in the state of North Carolina. Our school system does not prepare students from our communities to provide solutions for our conditions with only 28% of black children in Chapel Hill being prepared for college readiness exams. So it's important to contextualize this history and to understand this history because this means that the cycle continues each generation. Now that can be connected to this historical policies, and that is a sin. So about two and a half years ago, Anna Richards, who was at that time the president of the NAACP, told me about an initiative sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce, and it was called the Big Bold Idea. And this is a town-wide call for ideas that would make Chapel Hill a better community. And this was really exciting to me because I had an idea for an educational program for local black children who were the descendants of the enslaved and the segregated communities to address educational disparity in the district. So the event was structured in rounds. There were over 500 submissions for the big bold idea. And I'm telling you, my heart was pounding and I held my breath for each of the five rounds that it took to whittle the ideas down to the top three at the selection event. And my idea was very similar to another group of educators. So we decided to merge our ideas together for a specific targeted detailed plan to address the academic generational gap between the children of privilege and the children of the invisible town who had been neglected for so long. So when the results were announced, I could not believe it. Not only had my idea gotten to through the first rounds, but it came in first, over 30 points ahead of the, the, the next popular, very good idea. So my hope for my beloved town had come true. Chapel Hill was finally ready to reckon with its past and do right by all of its children. So over the next couple of days, I anxiously checked the website for the announcement to the world. But this is what it said. That my big bold idea had been designated as a youth, youth equity program to serve all of the students in the school system. But friends, that was not my idea. Let me tell you what my big, bold idea actually said. This is what I presented. I told them that because of generational neglect, the descendants of the people who built the university have a special history with the university and the town and therefore need and have earned with their literal blood, sweat, and tears, a targeted remedy to suit those needs. Because narrative is important, I have been letting everyone know about the truth of what was presented for our local black children as compared to what has been offered to our community. Another broken promise and whitewashed narrative. <sighs> well, I still await progress of my actual idea coming into fruition. 
I do still have hope for my idea because the overwhelming majority of people got it. The community acknowledged this historic disparity and the community was willing to work towards a solution. As happens so often, the people are willing, but the power structure is cautious. Now facing this awkward and painful truth is bold, but it is our path forward. We need to tap into the underdeveloped intellectual talent that has always been here. And it shouldn't be that hard. I have seen success on a smaller scale time after time again. And look at all of the resources that we have in this affluent town. If we have specially targeted programs, and we should, to address the specific needs of the LGBTQ youth, to deal with discrimination and suicide rates in the community, and we have specially targeted programs, and we should, to address the specific needs of differently abled youth, to deal with the discrimination and the needs of that community. And if we have a specially targeted programs, and we should, to address the discrimination that comes with English not being the first language in some communities, then why would we not have specially targeted program? A specially targeted pre-K to 12 program for the descendants of the local people who built this university and offered them free college tuition to the school that their ancestors built. Imagine the oldest public university in the country and this town once again, becoming the model of inspiration for the rest of the country and reconciling truth to audacious action. The story of what has happened to black children in this school system is an important component of crafting a new narrative, as well as those stories of many generations of local people who have fought against it. And this brings us to our happy beginning. And I will not say it's a happy ending because this is a happy beginning. And it begins with you, with the good folks at St. Thomas More. In particular, I would like to thank the leadership team of Dave Sider, Mary Allen McGuire, Daryl Fulford, Carlos Lima, Colleen O'Brien, William Sturkey, Chris Faison, Kim Farrington, Coretta Sharpless, Candace Kelly, well, of course, I call her Candy, Suzanne Miller, Jane Hathaway, and of course, my cousin, Maxine Mason Huggins. The members of this congregation got it. They came to me for a partnership and collaboration and listened as I explained that we have never been bereft of knowledge, nor the desire to tap into all of our potential for our wonderful children in the community. We've always had innovative ideas and very importantly, understanding about the best way to educate our children. The thing that we have not always had though, are resources and people who were willing to listen to the people who were in the best position to provide these solutions for our children. And often this takes the form of black women educators. So that's just what this leadership team did. And it wasn't always easy because those meetings were at seven o'clock at night and y'all might be some church folks, but this team could hang in there. They could hang out late. <laughs> and we also had what I'm sure were very uncomfortable conversations that were not always easy to have. And what's not talked about often, but is absolutely true, is that these conversations also involve a, an incredible amount of trauma. At least for me, just remembering these atrocities 
And this trauma can sometimes come up, but we didn't give up. And the Monsignor Thomas P. Haddon Reparative Scholarship came into fruition. And the people are with us. I tweeted out this one little celebratory uh, statement on the scholarship and I received over 12,000 impressions on Twitter and not one negative comment in the bunch. I am very proud of the scholarship, but I'm most proud of the process of working together to get there. One thing that has happened is that we centered the community that was most affected by this history. And I hear that we have a new scholarship in the work to address the needs of the Latino community. And I pray that you use this model that we developed to place their leadership at the center of this new scholarship because they know what is best for their community. But what is so wonderful is that now we have a model of collaboration based in equity that we can use for the future. So I propose that we not stop there. Let's put our best working boots on and let's keep on working to build, as the late Bob Moses said, a floor for our children so that none will fall through. And I hope we will continue our work together with my community foundation, Bridging the Gap, to provide scholarships for all of the descendants of the enslaved, and then use that model of success to provide a sound education for every child in Chapel Hill. And I know we can do it because God told me so. And now St. Thomas More has opened the floodgates. I'd like to thank you so much for this partnership. And I'd also like to thank you for asking me to share space with you today. And now I would like to be in conversation and learn from you. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. I'm ready for any questions or comments or learning opportunities, Amanda. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Janina. That was such a beautiful witness to local history, local Black history, but local history in Chapel Hill. Um, now is the portion of the night where we will shift into addressing questions from the audience. So this is just a reminder that if you have any questions, please input them in the Facebook comments and we will do our best to get to them before the end of the presentation. And so our first question has come up. In the quote you mentioned, history doesn't just go backwards, it goes forward as well. How can we promote a new methodology of authentic history telling as we move forward in time? Would you repeat that question for me, Amanda? Yes. In the quote you mentioned, History doesn't just go backwards, it goes forwards as well. How can we promote a new methodology of authentic history telling as we move forward in time? Thank you for that question, for whoever asked the question. For the last, um, since about 2014, I've been working at Duke Center for Documentary Studies, and I've been working with veteran activists from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And I've been working on a process called the critical oral histories methodology. What we oftentimes talk about when we talk about racial equity is we talk about the need to highlight um, equity. A lot of times we don't necessarily talk about the need to employ these practices as we're collecting this history. And so what that normally means is we needed a model of collaboration that was not extracted, not extractive and also centered the people who were actually the, um, the people who made the history and grant them authority. We needed to do away with a lot of these old antiquated release forms that caused so much distrust in the community because the, the typical relationship would be that a researcher would come into community with already with an idea of the story that they wanted to tell, center themselves in the community and then get people to corroborate their history. The process of the critical oral histories centers the people who actually made the history and then provides research and um, primary source documents based off of what folks in the community think are the most important things. And I think that's a really good question because I think we're in a moment now where we're prepared to talk about equity 
And I think it's very important to center the process of collaboration. So I think what your question is talking about is how can we collaborate together? And I think we have to be very mindful about building these bridges and think about how to construct these bridges together. And so that's what I've been working on since about 2014. But at the end of the day, it really requires us to be uh, very conscientious about centering equity as we as we enter into these conversations. Thank you, Danita. Yes, centering on collaboration is the way forward for sure. Our next question is in regard to a comment you said, clarification of a comment. Um, you mentioned a 75% decline of teachers. Um, could you explain that reason again? Oh, sure. Of course, we know that um, there was great reluctance, even in Chapel Hill, which was progressive as compared to a lot of the rest of the state. So when Brown v. Board was decided in 1954, our school system did not desegregate until 1966. So um, this kind of really uh, dovetails on the conversation that we just had about centering equity, because what really happened was when the schools um, desegregated, because there was not thought about what would happen to the teachers of the segregated high schools, we went into the normal, more normative practices of discrimination. And so the people that lost their job when the schools merged were the black teachers, the black coaches, um, the black administrators. And when the students from Lincoln High School joined a larger high school, we also lost black student leadership which was very important and vital to um, participation in the PTA, to thinking about things like sports and um, leadership in the community. So because Chapel Hill was such a very vibrant and close knit community, what that really meant was we lost our way because we lost 75% of the things that rooted us in this community. And so that's what I meant when I said that we lost 75% of the people who girded our children up and really sent them into an environment where a number of the teachers had negative attitudes towards the students. And some of the students were able to release all type of aggression on these students, on these young people who were coming into this newly integrated environment. Thank you, Danita. Our next question. You work with school systems, universities, activists, and historians collaborating to document local and national history from the inside out and the bottom up. In your documentation research, what have you found the most surprising? You know what I found most surprising? <laughs> and it's surprising even to say it. What I found most surprising is how little we really know about things that we thought we knew about. Um, and we really don't know a lot because of the extracted methodology that I talked with you about before, people just kind of coming into the community already with a story in mind and just getting what they want to get and having people collaborate. And um, a lot of the research that I found for the Chapel Hill Nine, I actually found when I was doing national research if you look at a lot of the writings and if you look a lot uh, at a lot of the local writings about the civil rights movement in Chapel Hill, it normally starts in about 1963. But that's because there was such a huge university presence. But what I found when I was looking through the archives and primary source documents from SNCC and CORE, and the CORE was very um, influential during this time, they all talked about these little kids from Chapel Hill, these little high school students at Chapel Hill that had all these guts. And so, of course, I started to pair those primary source documents in that research and go back and understand different, type of quest different types of questions to ask. And then uh, when I was working with the students, uh, the former students of SNCC, I went into Mississippi. I traveled to Mississippi and um, because we know about Bob Moses, we know about a lot of the people who did such wonderful, tremendous things. What we did not know a lot about was the community that was ready to receive them. And so I traveled to Mississippi, I traveled to Jackson, Mississippi and went through some of these old civil rights offices 
And the thing that is most compelling to me is how much we don't know. And I believe there was an article written in the New York Times, sometimes within this past week, was talking about this very thing. And we were talking about how we remember things differently and the urgency by which we need to approach this work because a lot of the things that we thought we understood about the motivations and things that happened with the civil rights movement, we're finding out that we didn't have the best understanding. And the best way to understand is to work with these elders now to try to get their stories. And the challenge is, of course, that we're losing elders every day. So there's this kind of rush to talk, to document and tell this history, but the process by which we document and tell this history is very, very important. So we do need to center uh, equity at the, at the um, center of our interactions and um, our conversations with these folks. So once again, the way that we build these bridges, the process is the most important thing. Thank you for that question. Thank you. And this will be our last question of the night. Um, what are one or two practical, practical steps that's, that can be done as we yearn to actualize a culture of racial healing? Well, you know, I will say that it is so important that we listen to people who have been marginalized because that's where we're going to find the most important um, steps forward. People who have been marginalized also typically have good ideas in terms of how to bring that together. I do think we need to pray. I do think that we need to um, make sure that we are centering righteousness, righteousness in our interactions. And most importantly, I think we need to stop talking as much as we do to action. And that's why I think that I am so incredibly proud of the work with St. Thomas More and this reparative scholarship. This is the first type of scholarship like this in Chapel Hill. And we've been talking about doing things for the descendants of the enslaved or doing things to bring up the um, academic gap. We've been talking about it for over 60 years, but St. Thomas More decided to put that talk to action and that's what we need. Please, Amanda put, um, put my foundation bridging the gap we need people to advise in the community. We need people to form these bonds. We need a movement in Chapel Hill that is centered in love and acceptance and bridge building, but very much committed to doing audacious action. And that's what we need. So please check me out, Bridging the Gap, email me, contact me. And I believe in the people. And I believe that just like in the 60s, the faith community is in the best position to offer help to the folks in the community who have been marginalized. So that's what I would say for that. Thank you. And, and that's all the time that we have for Q&A. Um, I wanna extend a huge thank you to Danita for taking the time to give this wonderful presentation to the Catholic community of St. Thomas More. We are so grateful for your wisdom and your passion and shedding light on the beauty and importance of celebrating our Black history, as well as all that you've done for Chapel Hill and beyond. So thank you so much, Janita. It's been an honor. Well, th I have to thank you again, Amanda, for being so patient and taking me through this whole process of technology that I'm not as agile with. But I also really want to thank the members of St. Thomas More and hope that this is a beginning of a continuation of a relationship that is very strong. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Danita. Thank you. And thank you to all who have joined us tonight, wherever you may be. This month represents Black History Month, but may we continue to celebrate and honor the treasure of America's Black history outside of this month as well. This event is brought to you by the Image and Likeness Committee, Com Committee of St. Thomas More, and it will also be available on YouTube. Please join us next Monday, the 28th, same time, same place, with Dr. Tia Noel Pratt from Villanova University, University, who is the curator of the Black, Black Catholic Syllabus and who will be speaking with us about that. Please know of St. Thomas More's prayers for you all and have a great rest of your Monday night. Thank you.